Soda crackers are also called saltines, originally a brand name that over time became a generic term. You can eat them plain or spread something on them or crumble them into soup. Doctors even recommend eating soda crackers when you're nauseous because they're dry and easy to digest. They're flat and bumpy on the outside with a tasty texture resulting from some interesting chemical reactions. Workers first dump ice into a trough to prevent the dough from overheating during fermentation. The first ingredient is a specific amount of finished dough to kickstart the fermentation of this new batch. To that, they add water, wheat flour, yeast, and enzymes to help the fermentation. A mixer blends the ingredients for about five minutes. They let the dough sit for 16 hours while the enzymes break down the starch in the wheat into simple sugars. The yeast then reacts with those sugars, producing carbon dioxide gas, which makes the dough rise. Then they adjust the fermented dough's pH level with sodium bicarbonate to produce the right flavor, color, and shelf life. Then for additional flavoring, some salt, malted barley flour, and vegetable oil. Then the mixer remixes the dough for about five minutes to blend in these new ingredients. Now they let the dough ferment for another six hours. The sodium bicarbonate counteracts the acidity this produces and relaxes the gluten so that the dough now breaks easily when stretched, the perfect consistency for soda crackers. A machine then extrudes the mass of dough into a sheet that's two inches thick and folds the sheet over itself three times. This folding creates the light and flaky layers inside the cracker. The dough sheet then goes through a series of rollers that reduce it to its final thickness, about a millimeter. A revolving die cuts the cracker shapes, perforations and all. The little pins puncture the dough and push it firmly onto the conveyor belt. This keeps the dough from deforming when moisture and gases escape during the baking process. From there, the sheet passes under a shower of salt. The sheet now takes a three-minute trip through a long oven with different temperature zones. Gas flames bake the dough from above and below. The heat transforms the sodium bicarbonate in the dough into carbon dioxide gas, which then breaks through and escapes. This drives out trapped moisture and forms blisters in the crackers. As the sheet of baked crackers exits the oven, a roller breaks it into rows. The rows then run from one conveyor belt to the next, stacking like roof shingles. Alignment wheels keep them straight until the next set of wheels gently breaks the rows into individual crackers. Each row makes its way through a series of gates that guide it onto a track that leads to the packaging equipment. The crackers are upright now, and the machine begins dividing them according to the number of crackers per package. In this case, those little two cracker packs you often get with soup. The cracker pairs enter the wrapping machine, which sandwiches them between a sheet of printed plastic film. A wheel then simultaneously seals and cuts the wrapper between each pair. This all happens at an astonishing rate of 525 packages per minute. And that's the way the cracker crumbles.
The ice cream cone is the original edible container. Invented over a century ago, it adds crunch to the melt-in-your-mouth taste of ice cream. And it's one container that doesn't end up in the trash can. So you could say it adds a bit of virtue to the guilty pleasure of the double scoop. The first ice cream cones were rolled waffles. And today's cones are simply modern versions of that. Waffle cone batter starts with a lot of dark brown sugar. Caramel coloring is added, along with some secret flavoring ingredients. Water is piped into the blender. It's ice cold to keep the batter from getting too sticky. A computer controls the addition of flour from a tank on the floor above. Vegetable oil is added as a giant beater mixes all the ingredients. The batter then flows out of the blender and into a refrigerated tank. An agitating blade keeps the blend at the consistency of pancake batter. Next, nozzles deposit batter onto baking plates that look like moving waffle irons. Top plates flip down and the baking plates roll through a glass heated oven for a quick bake. The top plates lift up, revealing the cooked waffle patties. Automated arms help transfer the patties to rolling tools. The tools grab the patties and twist them into cones. The cones fall down a chute and ride an open elevator up and down to cool and harden. The waffle cones slide down another chute and move into lanes on a conveyor. Automated fingers help guide them into paper jackets. A computer with a camera eye counts the cones and sends a message to a machine that stacks them in the right increments. Here, a technician activates a device that pushes on a ball inside a cone to test the cone's breaking point. Looks like this waffle cone can hold up to some heavy licking. Over in the sugar cone department, the baking plate system is designed differently. It makes patties that are fan-shaped and have a flat edge. This shape, along with a firmer batter, means sugar cones are stronger than waffle cones, so they're a more popular choice for hard ice cream. Packers stack the cones in styrofoam trays. Then the packages travel through a curtain of high-density polyethylene film. A heated sealer finishes the wrapping job. An X-ray machine sends information about the contents to a computer that counts the cones and alerts inspectors to any problems. Next, automated arms pick up cartons and open them so the packs of cones can be inserted. But there's still one more cone variety in the works, colorful cake cones. Cake cones are less sugary than other varieties and have a more cake-like texture. Batter is pumped into upright molds. Cake cones are shaped differently from waffle and sugar cones because they have flat rather than pointed bottoms. Metal cores plunge into the molds to complete the shape. This action also enhances the cake cone's flaky texture. The cones are baked as they pass by a gauntlet of gas heaters. Then it's down a chute and off to the packaging station. Unlike the other cones, cake cones come out flaky and crispy without a cooling down period. A mechanical arm picks up paper sleeves and drops them in front of the cones. These cones are now on their way to an ice cream stand near you, where they'll be used to scoop up ice cream lickety-split.
As early as the 1400s, Africans made peanut stews. Peanut butter as we know it today was invented in 1890 by an American doctor. He used it as a protein substitute for people whose teeth were so bad they couldn't chew meat. The best peanuts for making peanut butter are runner peanuts. Because they're uniform in size, they roast more evenly than peanuts that vary in size. They arrive at the peanut butter factory already shelled. To make an 18 ounce jar of peanut butter, it takes 20 ounces of peanuts. That's about 1,100 peanuts. The first step is to roast them. The nuts travel through a hot air roaster heated to 399 degrees Fahrenheit. The shaking motion moves them around so they roast evenly. Almost four tons of peanuts go through this roaster per hour. When they come out, they've turned from white to light brown. Next, they go into another machine, which fast cools them at room temperature, using suction fans that circulate air quickly. This rapid cooling process is critical. It halts the cooking and prevents the peanuts from losing too much oil. Next, the peanuts go through a machine called the blancher. It removes the outer skins by rubbing them between rubber belts. Then it splits the kernels and removes the heart of the peanut which has a slightly bitter taste. But what's discarded doesn't go to waste. The skins go to farmers for pig feed, and the hearts go into bird feed. The peanuts land in a big stainless steel hopper. From there, they drop down into the grinder to be ground into a paste. At this point, the other ingredients go in. Salt, sugar, or another natural sweetener, and a small amount of hydrogenated vegetable oil which acts as a stabilizer to keep the peanut oil from separating and floating to the top of the jar. Peanut butter contains no artificial coloring or artificial sweeteners. It has no preservatives either, yet doesn't need to be refrigerated. The peanut butter is finally ready. All that mixing has heated it up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. It goes through a cooling system to bring it down to 100 degrees. Now it can go into jars. Peanut butter is a healthy, protein-rich food with plenty of vitamins, minerals, and fiber. It has no cholesterol, but it does contain fat. The good news is that more than 80% of that fat is unsaturated. In other words, good fat that may actually help lower certain cholesterol levels in the blood. The bad news is that the rest of the fat content is trans fat, or bad fat. It comes not from the peanuts themselves, but from the hydrogenated vegetable oil that's used as the stabilizer to keep the peanut oil from separating. If you want to avoid that, you can eat all natural peanut butter, which doesn't contain a stabilizer. You'll just have to stir the peanut oil that collects at the top of the jar. Once the jars are filled with peanut butter, they go through the capping machine. The caps have an aluminum seal inside. As the caps pass through a heat machine, the seal drops down and adheres to the top of the jar, creating an airtight seal. A machine prints the production date and the expiration date. These unopened jars of peanut butter will stay fresh for one whole year. Donuts used to be called oily cakes because they were deep fried in pork fat. When Dutch pilgrims first brought them to America, they were ball shaped. But then someone found that removing a nut of dough from the center 
helped them cook far more evenly. And so, the donut was born. In the world of donuts, there are two basic types, yeast donuts and cake donuts. The batter for cake donuts drops from the mixer right into boiling vegetable oil. The nozzles shape the dough as it passes. The donuts fry for about a minute and a half. Then a conveyor carries them out of the vat to cool. Yeast donuts require more time to make. A high-speed mixer works the yeast dough, then workers pull it off the machine into bins. From there, it goes into a hopper that extrudes the dough as a sheet. Then it's onto another conveyor belt where a series of rollers flatten the dough sheet to just three quarters of an inch thick. The sheet passes under a shower of cinnamon, then hits a rotating cylinder that rolls it into a log. A small metal rod sprinkles the dough with water. This keeps it sticky enough to hold its shape while going under another flattening roller. A dusting of cornstarch keeps the dough from sticking to the blade that now cuts it into pieces. A retractable arm drops the blocks of dough, four at a time, onto wire mesh trays. Then it's off to the proofer, a machine much like a large bread box in which heat and humidity help the yeast dough rise. This leavening process takes about 20 minutes, during which time the trays, over 300 of them, go up and down and then out to the fryer. A gate slows the donuts down just before the drop so they slide in without splashing hot oil. Gas burners keep the oil at a constant boil. Anything less and the donuts would come out partly raw. Halfway through, they get a flip so they'll cook evenly throughout. After two minutes, the donuts leave the fryer and move through a curtain of sweet glaze. A strong air current blows off the excess. And these fry cakes are ready to eat. They gradually cool as they spiral through the production area on their way to packaging. Now let's see how they make donuts with filling. A machine separates the yeast dough into little blobs, then sends them rolling down plastic tunnels. This shapes them first into pucks, then into round dough balls. Rollers then flatten the balls before they enter the proofer to rise. There's cornstarch everywhere to prevent the dough from sticking to the machinery or to the conveyor belt. Row after row of donuts fry in hot oil then slide into a large drum that tumbles them around, covering them with a sugary coating. Now it's time for the donuts to get filled. These nozzles inject just the right amount of jelly. Each worker fills 45 donuts a minute. After filling, these donuts known as Bismarck's are ready to go on to packaging. They're just one of the many delicious varieties that this factory turns out on a daily basis. We don't know exactly when popcorn first exploded onto the snack scene, but it was likely thousands of years ago. Popcorn grains dating back nearly 5,600 years have been discovered in caves in New Mexico. 
and down through the ages, this unique grain just keeps popping up. Nothing says it's showtime like a big bowl of popcorn. This grain has certainly made it big in the entertainment biz. This success story has its roots on the farm, of course. Popcorn is one of six types of corn, and it's the only kind that pops. They even breed the popcorn plant to enhance traits like color, taste, and popability. By fall, the crop is ready to harvest. Peeling back the husks reveals kernels that are smaller and harder than those of other corn. At harvesting, popcorn has moisture content of 16 to 20 percent. That's a bit too high, so to bring it down to 14 percent, they condition the crop in these giant bins, pumping warm air up through it to accelerate the drying. It's a critical step. Popcorn that's too dry may not pop, and if it's too wet, it could spoil when stored. In the factory, a series of oscillating screens sift chunks of cob and broken kernels out of the popcorn. Vacuum pipes pull the finer impurities to a dust collector and suck the larger impurities into a chute. They end up in a waste bin to be discarded or used in animal feed. At this junction, the system funnels the filtered popcorn in one direction and the impurities in another. It's the perfect opportunity to see the difference between the two streams. The purification process continues at the gravity table. Its vibrating action, along with powerful fans, cause the popcorn to rise and float on air. In the process, kernels that are too heavy or too light gravitate away from the center and are shunted aside. The grains in the middle of the mass are the optimal size, but leaving nothing to chance, they go through one more screening. The kernels now head into a very different kind of sorter. Inside, the kernels fly by an electric eye. It detects remaining debris or defective grains. The machine sends a blast of air to get rid of them. It's time to test a sample of the production run. He pours in a half pound of kernels along with some oil. As the pot reaches 446 degrees Fahrenheit, the water in the kernels starts to steam. As the pressure builds, those kernels explode and turn inside out. This reveals the starchy part of the kernel and creates a white, fluffy puff. To pass this test, the popcorn has to expand 44 and a half times the original volume. The tester loads the pop puffs into a tube with measurements on it, and this batch of popcorn is right on the mark. As you can see, a little bit of popcorn can really go a long way. From a pea-sized kernel to a puffy white treat in a matter of minutes. And although popcorn kernels come in a range of colors, that starchy part that's exposed by popping is always white. Now it's all in the packaging. Maintaining the correct amount of moisture in each kernel is critical. Heat sealing the bag locks in the grains to keep them from drying out on a store shelf. This paper bag, destined for the concession market like movie theaters, is multi-layered. It includes a vapor barrier to control moisture loss. It's taken six months to grow this popcorn and a couple of weeks more to process it but it will all be worth it at snack time. Because when these grains explode into a mountain of munchies, there should be enough for the whole gang. Before refrigeration, ice cream was a handmade luxury. Ingredients went into a mixing bowl, inside a tub filled with ice and salt water. The salt helped the ice absorb heat, cooling the mixture to below freezing. 
In the 1920s, commercial freezers made mass production possible, and the ice cream industry was born. To make ice cream treats, you first have to make the ice cream. It all begins with fresh cream. The factory stores it in refrigerated silos set just a few degrees above freezing. The silos feed a high-speed mixer that blends the cream with other ingredients. The main dry ingredients are powdered skim milk and plant-based stabilizers and emulsifiers. Stabilizers prevent the ice cream from crystallizing, and emulsifiers allow the mix to bond with air during the whipping process. The other ingredients are sugar and corn syrup. After about three minutes of mixing, a pumping system moves the mixture into pasteurization tanks and heats it to 162 degrees for half an hour, killing any bacteria and activating the stabilizers. Then the factory homogenizes the mixture, a process that breaks up the fat globules giving the ice cream a smooth texture. The mixture is cooled and concentrated vanilla flavoring is added. Then, the concoction is chilled and whipped for about 15 seconds. Whipping blends the mix with air, transforming it from a liquid to a soft solid. Without air, the finished product would come out looking like frozen milk rather than ice cream. The ice cream sandwich wafers are made of chocolate cake ingredients. A filling machine feeds two lines of wafers toward an injection pipe. Just as two wafers come together, the machine injects a third of a cup of vanilla ice cream in between. The pipe's head shapes the ice cream into a rectangular slab that fits perfectly between the wafers. All this happens at a rate of 140 ice cream sandwiches per minute. As the sandwiches move on to packaging, the filling is still ice cold from the freezing phase, so there's no threat of a meltdown. The packaging system raises each sandwich into a wrapper, then folds and tucks the ends. The next machine counts the sandwiches and inserts them into boxes. Once sealed, the boxes go directly into a storage freezer at minus 22 degrees. On another line, ice cream cone production is underway. A feeder drops pre-wrapped sugar cones into holders on a conveyor belt. Sprayers coat the insides with a chocolatey layer, which adds flavor and creates a barrier between the cone and ice cream. So the cone remains crispy until you eat it. Next, nozzles squirt in the ice cream filling. One production line, two flavors. One row of cones gets vanilla ice cream, the other row, chocolate. Now for a tasty surprise in the cone's core, an injection of liquid caramel. This factory also makes ice cream cones with chocolate and strawberry sauce inside. Next, a chocolate-flavored liquid topping. Then, the crunchy finishing touch, a layer of chocolatey coated puffed rice. Finally, the cones move under a lid dispenser that applies a wax-coated paper lid to each one. A heating element instantly melts the wax, sealing the lid to the cone's paper sleeve. From here, the ice cream cones go into boxes, then straight into the freezer, ready to take a licking. The waffle started out in the Middle Ages as a flat wafer made not from wheat flour, but from oats or barley. As its popularity spread throughout Europe, many variations of shape and recipe developed. 
the introduction of leavening ingredients gave rise to the fluffy honeycomb breakfast cake we know today. The introduction of frozen waffles in the 1950s marked the dawn of a new era for these breakfast batter cakes. Making your morning waffles was suddenly a snap. All the big prep work takes place at the factory. They add flavorings like berries to a flour-based waffle mix, and then turn to the liquid ingredients, water, canola oil, and liquid cane sugar. They pour them into a big tank and mix thoroughly. Then they're ready to thicken it into a batter with the flour-based waffle premix. It also includes baking powder, which reacts with water to cause pockets of carbon dioxide to form for a leavening effect that will continue during baking. After adding more berries, this batter is complete, and there's enough in this one tank to produce 3,600 waffles. Hot waffle irons move past a sprayer for a misting with a nonstick coating. Down the line, an automated pump deposits measured amounts of batter onto each grid plate. The top grid plates encase the batter. This production line is computerized, which ensures the plates are filled quickly and without any spills. As they move towards the oven, the waffle irons rotate allowing the batter to reach all the crevices inside. They now move through a long gas oven. It takes about two minutes for them to cook. They emerge from the oven piping hot, where a machine called a picking drum removes them from the irons. As the picking drum revolves, needles grab the waffles and pull them off the hot grid plates. The picking drum transports the waffles up to another level. The needles retract, transferring to a series of conveyors. At the other side of the factory, the waffles enter a blast freezer. The temperature inside is minus 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Fans blow frigid air onto the waffles as they spiral through the freezer. It takes just 20 minutes to freeze and preserve these freshly baked waffles. The frozen waffles now merge into lanes to be sorted for stacking. A kind of trapdoor system releases them three at a time to grippers that move them onto a conveyor. The conveyor lane narrows, which forces the waffle stacks into a single row. A sensor-activated gate releases the stacks, two at a time, to the packaging station. It takes just a second for the two stacks of frozen waffles to be wrapped and sealed in a tight cellophane packet. Then it's into a metal detector. To demonstrate how it works, we place a quarter on one of the packages. The system senses it immediately, and a blower blasts the package off the conveyor. Suctioning fingers now pick up the outer paperboard box and open it as they place it on the conveyor. A ram then shoves the wrapped waffles into the box. Incredibly, they churn out more than 8,600 waffles an hour at this factory, catering to different tastes and dietary requirements. And that merits a toast. <laughs>